Hey Optimancers, Chris here. So in my last video I discussed the new bugbear in Monsters of the Multiverse, and I specifically looked at the surprise attack feature, which is really potent. Looking at how to get the most out of this feature, the build that really stood out to me is Gloomstalker, Battlemaster Fighter, and then three levels of Assassin for that first turn advantage. As I mentioned, that seems to be a near consensus amongst my viewers that that is the build. And as I mentioned, that build has been done. So my question in that video and to myself honestly was, is that the best build for Bugbear? Or is it like the build for Bugbear? As in, if you're going to play a Bugbear, why even play anything else? Is a Bugbear even paying off if we're not getting those big Gloomstalker boosts? So if you'll Bugbear with me, I would like to discuss the process of coming up with that build. So one thing I do find is that I go down into the comments section and there are people who watch this channel who don't play D&D. &D, and not because they don't want to, but because they just can't find a group. And I currently play with people who started learning about D&D &D by watching this channel, had never played D&D, &D, and then, you know, they joined my Patreon. So they got a chance to actually play D&D because &D they didn't get to. So I was approached by Colby from D4 Deep Dive about promoting a new app that he's involved in uh, that is going to help people find groups to play in and I told him you don't have to pay me I will gladly talk about this because I think that there are people watching this channel who could really benefit from this so basically if you are either looking for a group and can't find one or maybe you're in a group and it's not a good fit for you or maybe you're in a group and you just need to find some more players or maybe you need to find somebody to DM so there is a Kickstarter that starts, I believe it starts today. It's called the LFG app. The website you want to go to is lfg-app.com. And basically the way this works is it's kind of like Tinder for D&D players. So you create a profile and then you have that you're looking for a player or a GM. And then you're looking for somebody who plays in person or online. And how far you're willing to travel if you are playing in person, what kind of availability you have, so which days of the week, and which time of the day. And with something like this, the more people that sign up for it, the better it's going to work for you. So I wanted to go ahead and take an opportunity to promote this because I think it could be a great service that gets more people playing D&D. And the more people that are playing D&D, the better. I looked for a long time at how to make the most out of that feature, and as I said, you need to not only look at the number of attacks, but chance to hit as well, and it's all for nothing if you don't win initiative. But I should be clear what I mean by win initiative. Here our bugbear is going into battle with some frost giants. Does he need to beat all three on initiative? No, really he only needs to beat one of them. Now your DM may roll initiative for them as a group. In which case, yeah, you need to beat them all. But if they're rolled separately, then as long as you beat one of them, you're golden. And we're not always just fighting one type of creature. We had some winter wolves here. They're at least going to have a separate initiative to the frost giants. But we want a decent initiative at least. Because let's be honest, if we're doing a ton of damage, we want to hit those frost giants. So we need to beat them on initiative. Now something I found interesting was that Surprise attack says you need to hit with an attack roll, but it doesn't say it needs to be a weapon attack roll. So that opens up spell attacks as well. And when I say I played around with a build for a while, usually what I mean is I messed around with some options for maybe a few hours or maybe even a day. But this one I actually spent days on. My goal was to have a character who would win initiative fairly reliably, be able to make a lot of attacks on their first turn, and that actually excludes a lot of stuff. Like, if you need setup over a turn, it's out, right? It's got to be, right off the bat, lots of attacks. Also, I wanted a reasonable number of hits with those attacks. And I want to do this without using Gloomstalker at all. And that's easy, right? It's surprising how often my builds kept leading me back to Gloomstalker. It was almost unbugbearable. I looked at the Beast Barbarian... I figured the claws give us an extra attack with our attack action. With a couple levels of fighter, we can action surge. At level 7, barbarians get advantage on initiative. And at level 2, reckless attack can give us advantage on attacks. 
I figured it was a near perfect fit. The Bugbarian. Even the name was easy. But you know what? I looked a little closer. To get the claws, you need to rage. So there's your bonus action. And look at this. You only get the extra attack once on your turn. So with Action Surge, that's five attacks total. And five attacks isn't bad, but I mean, any character with extra attack and Action Surge and a bonus action attack can get that many attacks on round one. So this wasn't standing out as much as I thought it would. And not that it's a bad way to go. I mean, Bugbear is still adding 2d6 to five attacks with advantage. And I think if you are going with a Barbarian build, Bugbear is a strong choice. But I figured for sure, Beast Barbarian would be a net gain in number of attacks on round one, but really it doesn't. All you really need is a bonus action attack, an action surge, an extra attack, you can get the five attacks. So then I considered the Moon Druid. The Deinonychus is a CR1 beast, so we could wild shape into it at level two. Kind of makes me feel dirty to go Moon Druid level two and then go into wild shape, but it gets three attacks and you maybe get a fourth if you get pounce. Though, in order to do that, you would already need to be wild shaped because it uses a bonus action. But if we add two levels of fighter, we're up to six attacks or maybe seven. So that's really good. But do we win initiative? The Deinonychus has a plus two dexterity. That's not that great. Our original form might have plus three maximum. If only there was a way to add our wisdom to initiative. All right, Gloomstalker, here we go again. And yes, it did occur to me, you could take a dip in Twilight Cleric and get advantage on initiative. But am I going to present a build on this channel with Moon Druid 2 and Twilight? I really don't want to do that. And also, although this build performs fantastically from levels 2 through 5, I mean, Moon Druids always do, but it's going to be a pretty big plateau afterwards because this is a build that really is centered around those low levels. I mean, we'll eventually get higher level druid spells, but we've already invested three levels into other classes. Then I thought about Scorching Ray. I figured we could combine Warlock and Sorcerer, and then we could quicken a Scorching Ray, then follow it up with an Eldritch Blast, and then we could use an Action Surge Eldritch Blast if we added in two levels of Fighter. Then I figured, how do I win initiative with this build? You can add three levels of Swashbuckler to add Charisma to initiative, but that's a lot of levels in Rogue, and we're not even able to use Sneak Attack with Scorching Ray. It can only be used with ranged or finesse weapons. So I had to think, are there subclass options for winning initiative with Warlock and Sorcerer? Well, there's Wild Magic Sorcerer. We can use Tides of Chaos and maybe Bend Luck if we need to. And there's Fiend Pact Warlock. This gives us a feature at level six that we could add to an ability check, and it's a D10, so that could add to our initiative as well. But wait, didn't I just do a Wild Magic Sorcerer multi-class with Fiend Pact Warlock? Yes, I did. It's my last build, in fact, so I'm not going to do it again. It occurred to me that with Thief 3, we could use an object as a bonus action. Then if we got like 11 levels in Artificer, we get a spell storing item that I've recently been informed with tweets from Jeremy Crawford as support, is a use an object action. So Scorching Ray, which we can get through Artillerist, then bonus action Scorching Ray, then we could action surge Scorching Ray. So 11 Artificer, three Rogue, two Fighter. Uh, that's a 15th level character. That's pretty late in the game for something to come together. And also we're not upcasting that Scorching Ray very much because Artificer is a half caster. Then we've taken five levels in non-casting classes. I also kept falling into the trap of focusing so much on round one that I was left with a build that wasn't so hot on round two. Another thing I found is there are a lot of builds where you Nova for exactly five attacks. Two levels of Fighter for Action Surge, then you could go seven levels of Watcher's Paladin, or seven levels of Battlesmith or Armorer, or seven levels of Barbarian, all these builds have ways to improve initiative, and they all have a five attack Nova. And I think they're all fine. And what I decided was, you know what? These builds have unique advantages, and Bugbear is a good racial choice for any of them. So I think you actually have a ton of options with Bugbear. I mean, I even just considered doing a straight fighter. 
like make a samurai and then take the alert feat. Bugbear works really well for that build. And essentially I confirm my initial suspicion. Gloomstalker is the prime choice for a bugbear. It just is. However, bugbear is still a good racial choice for lots of other builds. But like I said, I thought about this for days, punched math for days, juggled classes and subclasses and level mixes, and you know what I ended up with? Wizard. Yo, Wizard, you're always my savior. Really, Wizard works well here. We can get lots of attacks for an overround burst, then be an awesome wizard after that. We can eventually get crazy numbers of attacks. Watch what this build can do at level 13, for example. Okay, so that's enough setup. What I'm going to be doing here is first off, if you want to see this build, there's a link in the video description. Click on that, it will take you to the D&D Beyond page. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to discuss how this build is going to work, and then I'm just going to highlight some of the things it can do at various levels, rather than going through every minutia. If you want to know what I took for background, click the link. So level one, let's talk about a racial choice. And I figured we would go with custom lineage. Just kidding, we're going bugbear. Ability scores, you can do three plus ones now. So we'll put them in dexterity, constitution, and intelligence, and then we'll max those out. So 16 in dexterity, constitution, and intelligence. And class, we're actually gonna start with a dip, like a one level dip in fighter. Now normally, I would go to artificer for a dip before doing a wizard because it gives us armor, it gives us constitution saving throws, and it progresses our spells. However, we're eventually gonna want action surge here. So at some point, we're gonna want two levels of fighter, and we don't want three levels that aren't wizard. So for now, we're gonna go fighter to get the armor proficiency and the constitution saving throws, and then we'll come back for a second level of fighter later on. We get second wind, so bonus action self-heal. Low levels, this is actually quite good. At high levels, well, it's a touch of healing. And our fighting style. So we're gonna be using a weapon here at low levels, but by level five, we really won't be worrying about weapons much. So I actually like superior technique here. This gives us a D6 superiority die and one maneuver to use it on. I think there's two obvious options for maneuvers. First is precision, to potentially turn a miss into a hit. And the second is ambush, which gives us a chance to boost an initiative roll. I'm going to select ambush. I figure if we don't win initiative, we're not getting surprise attack. And there's this thing on D&D Beyond. So superior technique just doesn't work. It doesn't give you your D6 superiority die, and it doesn't give you a choice of maneuvers. It's just broken. I checked the D&D Beyond website, and they said it's not functional. They don't know how to program it. So there's a workaround you can do on your character. So I'm just going to quickly go over that. So what you do is you go to your character sheet. You're going to go to Features and Traits, so this menu right here. And then you're going to scroll down until you see Manage Feats. You're going to click Manage Feats, and this sidebar comes up. And then we're going to scroll down here, and we're going to look for Martial Adept. There it is. We're going to add it. And then you can see it gets this little choices needed. We click down on it. And first off, it gives us our D6 superiority die. And second, it's going to give us two choices for maneuvers. Of course, superior technique only gives us one choice. So what we're going to do is we're going to leave the second one unselected. And the first one will take our ambush maneuver. And then what this will do is basically it'll give you the exact same thing that you get from Superior Technique. So here it is, Martial Adept, you get the D6 Superiority die, and we have Ambush. So that's the fix for that. So like I said, I'm just gonna highlight some stuff here of how to make this build. So we're starting with the one level fighter. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take two levels of wizard, and we're taking the War Magic subclass. Uh, the reason we want War Magic is for Tactical Wit. This allows us to add our intelligence modifier to our initiative rolls, it's going to give us a really good initiative score. The other thing War Magic is giving us is Arcane Deflection. This is also really good. Uh, so basically, we can use our reaction, we can get a plus two to our AC. So if you run out of shield spells, that's something you could do. Uh, but the big one that comes up is you can use your reaction and give yourself a plus four bonus to a saving throw. And this is done after you fail the saving throw. So there's no guesswork. If you fail the saving throw by four or less, you use Arcane Deflection and you succeed. There is a downside. Once you use it, you can't cast spells other than cantrips until the end of your next turn. But 
If it's an important saving throw, it's going to be worth that. For spells, I mean, when you get your first level wizard, you're going to grab sleep. I'm going to use that as kind of your big spell. Uh, then you'll be grabbing absorb elements. You'll be grabbing shield. And then the rituals of your choice. Make sure find familiar is one of them. And yeah, you're going to do just fine. So this character actually has already protected their concentration because they have constitution proficiency and they also have arcane deflection. So we have a plus three constitution modifier. And then right away, we have a plus two proficiency bonus. And then we're going to be adding up to plus four using arcane deflection if we need to. So that's already plus nine. And we're going to roll a one at least. So that's 10. 10 is our minimum concentration result if we use arcane deflection, meaning that our concentration is quite safe. If we take a small amount of damage, we can definitely succeed on that saving throw. Once we get into higher levels and our proficiency bonus goes up, we won't even need arcane deflection for those low damage results. So what are we going to do with our ability score improvements? What we do is at level four of wizard and level eight of wizard, just get your intelligence up. You're getting so much here because with bugbear, Initiative is really important, and intelligence is now adding to our initiative score. Also, all our spell DCs go up, and we're primarily a wizard, and our attack rolls go up. With any spell attacks, we will be making spell attacks, not just with cantrips with this character, and I'm going to go over that as well. So we're a wizard. We're still going to take the go-to spells, right? So we're going to take web right as we get to third level in wizard and we're probably going to be wanting to pick up misty step and mirror image maybe at our fourth level of wizard but there is one spell i normally don't take that we will take because we are a bugbear and that is scorching ray so you fire three rays of fire and hurl them at targets within range you can hurl them at one target or several make a ranged spell attack for each ray on a hit the target takes 2d6 fire damage now, if we are using our surprise attack, then this doubles the damage, right? So whatever one hits is doing 4d6 fire damage instead of 2d6. That is potentially 12d6 fire damage right at level three in wizard. And once we get action surge, we could actually action surge this and that would give us six attacks. And one of these things that I always get on these videos is whenever I talk about action surge and spell casting, somebody says, you can't cast two level spells on your turn. Yes, you can cast two level spells on your turn. What you can't do is cast a bonus action spell and then cast a leveled spell. So if you do not use your bonus action, the whole restriction on number of spells per turn is out the window. But as soon as you cast a spell using your bonus action, any other spell on your turn must be a cantrip. So if I cast Scorching Ray with my action, then I action surge, then I cast Scorching Ray again with another action, but I'm not using my bonus action, it is entirely legal. Now, the really nice thing about Scorching Ray isn't just that you get to make three attacks with it, it also upcasts. So when you cast a spell using a spell slot of third level or higher, you create one additional ray for each slot above second. So if we are higher level, we could cast two upcast Scorching Rays. So let's say we use two fifth level slots at higher level. Well, fifth level slot would give you six rays twice. That would be 12 rays. That's 12 attacks. That's really good. Like if we consider that we were kind of maxing out at five attacks with all those other builds, we can get way more attacks here. And we're still taking care of our initiative. Now, one thing to consider though is Scorching Ray is fire damage. There are lots of creatures in the game you don't want to cast Scorching Ray at. If you are fighting a devil, you do not want to cast Scorching Ray or a red dragon. There's also lots of other creatures that are resistant to fire. So just keep that in mind. Scorching Ray isn't good against everything. But most creatures in the game are not resistant or immune to fire. And yeah, then this gives you a great way to get that surprise attack damage. But we want to keep our eye out for other ways to make those attacks against those devils and red dragons and fire elementals or whatever else is immune or resistant to fire. And the idea would be on round one, we do our Nova. So we're going to throw a ton of scorching rays and that's because we're likely winning initiative. And then on round two, we're just a wizard and wizards are great. So on round two, you throw your web or whatever it is that you're going to be doing. Now I have seen War Mage 
ranked as a poor subclass for wizards because of power surge at sixth level not being very good power surge yeah it's not very good i mean use it it gives you a little bit but i wouldn't worry about it we got so much at level two we're still better than most wizard subclasses Level 8, we get our Intelligence up to 20. This gives us the maximum spell DC, the maximum chance to hit with Scorching Rays or our Cantrips, and it also gives us our bonus to initiative. So now we're at a plus 8 bonus to initiative. That's pretty good. And remember, we have Ambush when we need it. And the level 10 War Mage ability is great. Durable magic. While you maintain concentration on a spell, you have a plus 2 bonus to armor class and all saving throws. This helps you maintain the concentration on the spell, by the way. And we already have medium armor proficiency. And I mean, at level one, we're going to use a heavy crossbow. But at level two, we can switch to cantrips. We don't need the two hands anymore. So we can equip a shield with scale mail armor, get an armor class of 18. Eventually, we can get that scale mail armor switched off to half plate. That gives us an armor class of 19. Then if we are concentrating on a spell, now we're at 21. Then if we use our reaction and cast a shield spell, we can get it to 26, and that's before any magic items. And we have a plus 4 proficiency bonus at this point, plus 3 from our constitution is plus 7, plus 2 for durable magic. We're already at plus 9 on our concentration saves, so we don't need to use arcane deflection unless we take a massive amount of damage, or our concentration is being tested by some other means than taking damage. But if we use Arcane Deflection, that's plus 13. And just to kind of go over what I would do with the rest of my ability score improvements, I'd take the Alert feat at level 12 in Wizard, and then that plus 8 initiative is going to jump up to a plus 13. Also, it prevents us from being surprised, because remember, surprised is going to ruin your day if you're playing a bugbear, because it means you'll never be able to use your surprise attack, because on that first turn of combat, even if you win initiative, you can't take any actions. At 14th level, if we use our Arcane Deflection, then we do a bit of damage to some creatures. That's okay. At 16th level, I would recommend the Lucky Feet. So Lucky is going to hit on a number of ways. Uh, so if we just roll terrible on initiative and we lose initiative and Ambush isn't going to save us, then what we need is a reroll. And Lucky will give us that. Also, those super important saving throws, if you miss them, Lucky can save you on those as well. And, I mean, we're taking War Wizard all the way. So, we'll have 18 levels in Wizard. And, yeah, so Spell Mastery. Might as well take Shield. Shield is just one of those things you're going to cast again and again and again. Though, I've made this build not using any setting-specific material. If you're allowed to use setting-specific material, Silvery Barbs is a good choice as well. And, same thing. Uh, second level spell, I took Misty Step. But if Strixhaven is allowed, I would consider Vortex Warp. And I'm just quickly going to run through spell selection here. And then I'm going to stop and talk a little bit about some of the choices and how they work with Bugbear. So Absorb Elements has nothing to do with being a Bugbear. It's just a good first level spell to take as a wizard. Use your reaction. Get resistance to an elemental damage type. And you get so many first level spells that I generally pick up a bunch of rituals. Because you're not going to be able to prepare them all. So grab a bunch of rituals. That's one of the advantages of being a wizard is you are a ritual caster. So Comprehend Languages is a good choice, and that's going to give you a ritual ability to understand any language. I like Detect Magic. It's a great way to determine where the magic items are. It also can determine if, like, an NPC has magic cast on them. Find Familiar is just a go-to, right? You're going to take Find Familiar for sure. It's a ritual. Familiars are super useful. They can do the help action. They're great as scouts. They can deliver healing potions, all that kind of stuff just helps your action economy. I've actually become more and more fond of the Long Strider spell because it's long duration, doesn't use your concentration, 10 foot movement can be very handy to have, and it upcasts well. So we can get Long Strider on our whole party eventually, and we might as well if we are in the middle of like exploring a dungeon. One hour might actually be several combats, and everybody having plus 10 movement, it's just going to be handy to have. Shield is pretty much a must, if you're not a wizard or a sorcerer, then you look for other ways you can get shield on your build because it's just the best defensive reaction in the game. Plus five to your armor class and it lasts for the entire turn. Sleep, I take it with my first level of wizard and I'd probably cast it as long as it's useful and that's going to pass. 
Uh, eventually, sleep just doesn't roll high enough to take out enemies. So, eventually, I wouldn't bother preparing it, but I would take it at my first level wizard. Unseen Servant is handy. It's basically like a long-range Mage Hand. Mage Hand can go 30 feet from you. Unseen Servant can go 60 feet from you. And potentially can do some things that Mage Hand can't do. Moving on to second level spells, we'll take Mirror Image. It's a good defensive spell, doesn't use your concentration. Whenever I say it's going to mean three automatic misses, there's always some correction that, well, Mirror Image, you got a roll, is not necessarily going to affect the attack you're concerned about. It also is much easier to hit, so uh, an attack that would have missed you would still hit a Mirror Image. All this stuff is true. Doesn't change the fact, Mirror Image is a layer of defense. And it remains an effective layer of defense, even at higher levels. Now, the issue is the action to cast it, and it doesn't last very long. But I have found it invaluable over and over again. Misty Step is a given. I mean, I often get this through Fey Touched, but I didn't end up with Fey Touched on this character. So we're going to select and prepare Misty Step. You just, you want to have this. You're going to get grappled or restrained or stuck behind a wall of force or something like that. And Misty Step is going to be a lifesaver. The one issue that comes up with Misty Step is that you have to see your destination. So if for some reason you can't see your destination, like you need to get to another side of like a solid wall or you're in a fog or magical darkness or anything else that might keep you from seeing your destination, it's not going to work. So we grab Dimension Door later on. I talked about Scorching Ray, so I won't bother talking about it again, other than to say, as we move up in levels, we'll be relying on Scorching Ray less. If I've got a third level wizard, I almost certainly have Web. Web is probably the best second level spell for wizards. It's a game changer in all kinds of combats. There are certain combats where Web's useless, and I did a whole video talking about kind of how to evaluate when to use web. So if you are interested in that, you can do a YouTube search for web 5e and my video is likely going to be one of the top ones there. If you're a wizard, you probably want counterspell, right? So we're going to take counterspell. And yes, with Monsters of the Multiverse, creatures have less spells than they used to, but the spells they tended to keep were the ones you wanted to counterspell anyway. So we still want Counterspell. Counterspell did not become obsolete after Monsters of the Multiverse. It's still super important, I think, to have. We're also going to have Dispel Magic. Both Counterspell and Dispel Magic are very good in different situations. It's not like I have Counterspell, so I don't need Dispel Magic. Yeah, you still need Dispel Magic. A creature comes into the fight and they cast Foresight on themselves at the beginning of the day. Counterspell isn't going to help you. Dispel Magic will. With third level spells, you want at least one like mass debuff or area of effect. And the one I put on here is Fear, at least arguably as good as any of the others. 30 foot cone, creatures that fail their save, I mean, they're, they're screwed, right? They have to drop everything they're holding. They have to use their action to dash away from you. They don't even get another saving throw until they can't see you anymore. Really strong third level spell. But you know what? If your personal preference is hypnotic pattern, go ahead. If your personal preference is slow, go ahead. They're all good spells. This is probably a spell I would have to come back for at a later level. This build has got a legal number of spells. So if you count up the number of spells, you can determine when they were taken. But this character is going to have more third level spells known than higher level spells known. Uh, because I came back for third level spells and fly is one of them. Fly's handy to have. If you can't fly on your own, then you probably want this spell. And it upcasts super well, so it's actually a good one to select at higher levels as well when you have those higher level slots, because then you can affect multiple creatures with it. Lehman's Tiny Hut. Basically, my rule is, when Lehman's Tiny Hut becomes an option, check with the other players. Is anyone getting Lehman's Tiny Hut besides you? There's no point in more than one player having this, but but if no other player has it, then you want it. Basically, it's going to make your long rests much, much more safe than if you don't have it. Phantom Steed, another spell I come back for, uh, is just a great maneuverability spell. Because the riding horse you summon has a movement speed of 100. Super fragile, right? It gets killed really, really easy. And as soon as it takes a point of damage, the spell ends. 
And after the spell ends, the steed sticks around for a minute to allow you to dismount. But it's just so much maneuverability, and it's a ritual, so it's not using a spell slot. So your steed died, well, I guess after the combat, we'll have to make another one. That brings us to fourth level spells. We'll be taking Dimension Door. I talked a little bit about this when I talked about Misty Step. Dimension Door is very useful in that you don't need to see the destination, but there's two other things. You can also bring along a passenger. That's super, super useful. I use Dimension Door all the time, not when I need to teleport, but when I need to get somebody else teleported. Now, if you have Vortex Warp, then maybe that's the option. But if Strixhaven's not available, Dimension Door is the way to do it. You can use Thunderstep as well, but Thunderstep has that limit of sight. And this has a range of 500 feet. So we can Dimension Door a long way away. Really one of the best fourth level spells. And I'd be selecting this right at level seven in Wizard. And the other spell I'd be selecting at level seven in Wizard is Polymorph, of course. Polymorph is super good at those levels where it's a relatively new spell and probably not as good at the higher levels but you know what i'll still keep it prepared it's okay even at those higher levels but i do find that when you first get it it's super good the last fourth level spell we'll take here is greater invisibility and i'm not even going to prepare it uh, but i will be using it for something else so we'll go back to greater invisibility later Fifth level, Rary's Telepathic Bond. This is a ritual, so we don't have to prepare it. And yeah, we'll just use it and give the whole party telepathic communication. It's not concentration, lasts an hour. So basically, you could have it up all the time if you wanted to. We'll take Wall of Force as well as a fifth level spell. This is kind of the go-to spell for ninth level wizards. Uh, and it's probably the first spell I would select. Wall of Force is a game changer. It's not good against all enemies. Some enemies, they can do bonus action teleports, and then Wall of Force doesn't really help you. And sometimes I've seen this where you're fighting a single enemy, and then you trap them in a Wall of Force, and, well, what do we do now? And they're inside that Wall of Force preparing all this stuff with spell casting, and you can't even stop them or counterspell them because they're on the other side of a Wall of Force. But Wall of Force is huge against so many creatures. When it's really great is like when you have multiple super tough creatures that can't teleport, you trap one in a wall of force, it doesn't get a saving throw, and it sits in that wall of force, unable to do anything, sitting on its legendary resistances, and then you kill his buddy, and then you drop the wall of force, and you kill the one in the wall of force, and basically divide and conquer. Probably at 10th level in Wizard, I'd grab Transmute Rock. Uh, the big thing about Transmute Rock is it's not concentration, and it actually has an unlimited duration, though that isn't really the point. The point is no concentration. And it's a massive and effective battlefield control. And Transmute Rock is one of those spells that does provide a saving throw, but even if you succeed on that saving throw, it still has a pretty dramatic effect on you. So I really like it as a wizard option. The last fifth level spell we'll take is Steel Wind Strike. So this is another really good option if we're not going to be using Scorching Ray. Like, what if instead of casting two 5th level Scorching Rays, we cast two Steel Wind Strikes? Steel Wind Strike allows us to choose up to five creatures we can see within range. We make a melee spell attack against each target. That means it does qualify for surprise attack. And on a hit, the target takes 60-10 force damage, which is lots of damage but we get to add another 2d6. And yeah, we can Steel Wind Strike, then we can Action Surge, and we can Steel Wind Strike again. So how much damage would that do? It'd do about 260 points of damage. Now, important to remember, we're splitting up that damage. We're attacking five different targets with Steel Wind Strike. So this isn't 260 points of damage to a single target. It is 260 points of damage spread around. But Steel Wind Strike has no friendly fire, so it's really good when you're fighting like multiple enemies and we don't necessarily have a safe way to lay down something like a fear spell or something like that. So yeah, Steel Wind Strike, it's a good spell and then we're making it better and it's also not fire damage, it is force damage, which is super reliable. So Scorching Ray has that reliability problem with the damage type, Steel Wind Strike does not have that issue. Once we get into six level spells, we're going to pick up Contingency right away. Contingency is something we can actually use with our surprise attack. So the idea is with Contingency, you choose a spell, a fifth level or lower that you can cast, that has a casting time of one action, and that can target you. 
you cast that spell called the contingent spell as part of casting contingency, expending spell slots for both, but the contingent spell doesn't come into effect. Instead, it takes effect when a certain circumstance occurs. You describe that circumstance when you cast the two spells. For example, a contingency cast with a water breathing might stipulate that the breathing comes into effect when you're engulfed in water or a similar liquid. The contingent spell takes effect immediately after the circumstance is met for the first time, whether or not you want it to, and then the contingency ends. And the duration of the spell, 10 days. So the idea would be, we're going to cast contingency when we're not adventuring, and we're going to also prepare greater invisibility, and we'll cast that as our contingent spell. And the trigger, well, we're going to want to activate it on our turn when we're making a surprise attack. So I guess we would just do something like a command word, like go contingency. And when we say that, then the greater invisibility comes into effect. And what the greater invisibility will do, well, it's going to use our concentration, and then it's going to make us invisible, and that means we're going to have advantage on our attacks, and attacks against us have disadvantage. And on round one, we wouldn't be concentrating on anything else, so we have our concentration available, and if we're going to do upcast scorching rays, and then action surge, and more upcast scorching rays, or we're going to do steel wind strike, and then action surge, and another steel wind strike, greater invisibility is going to give us advantage on all those attacks. That is going to significantly up our damage. And now we've kind of hit all three things we wanted to hit. We're able to do a lot of attacks on round one. We're able to hit with them reliably. And we're able to win initiative reliably. Those were the three kind of aspects I was looking for. And we're able to achieve it with War Mage. And even like when I was thinking about Warlock and Sorcerer, this was something I wasn't able to get, is greater invisibility on round one, or advantage on round one. I mean, you can do things like walk around with darkness and devil's sight. I did a whole video on why I think there's some issues with that. But this, I think, is pretty reliable. I mean, there's creatures with true sight, right? And so it's not going to improve your chance to hit them. But I think against most creatures, it's going to be pretty clutch. And remember, since we're using a command word, we're going to decide whether to use it. So if we're going to fight something that we suspect has true sight, then probably just save it. The other six level spell I'd take right away is Mass Suggestion. It's just a really good spell. Doesn't use a concentration, affects a bunch of creatures. If I have six level slots, I pretty much always can find a way to use Mass Suggestion. Probably not till 12th level in Wizard, but I will grab Scatter. Scatter is a mass teleport. So we choose five creatures and then we kind of just rearrange the chessboard. And any allies we're moving, then we don't have to worry about saving throws. So I definitely look at any allies that could benefit from being moved around, including myself. And then if I have any extras left over, then I see about taking a chance on an enemy. Wouldn't count on it working against enemy because saving throw... And I mean, at these high levels, lots of creatures have legendary resistances, but you might as well throw it at them anyway. Who knows? Soon as we get 7th level spells, we will grab Force Cage. Force Cage is just an amazing 7th level spell. It's not actually the most powerful 7th level wizard spell. The most powerful 7th level wizard spell is Simulacrum. However, I never choose Simulacrum. And the reason I never choose it is because... Usually, if I'm playing in a campaign and I get to the point where I can get 7th level spells as a wizard, I mean, I just finished a campaign where we eventually got 9th level spells, and I never took Simulacrum. But the reason I didn't take it is because I like the campaign, and Simulacrum breaks campaigns. And I didn't want to sabotage a campaign I was having fun in. But Force Cage isn't like that. Force Cage is really good, but it's not going to break your game. And I would select Crown of Stars. A uh, nice thing about Crown of Stars is it's a long duration with no concentration. And it gives you a bonus action attack. So yeah, that works with surprise attack. So the idea would be we would cast this and then maybe in the next combat we win initiative, use our bonus action, throw a Crown of Stars attack, and it gets a bonus D6. And then same thing in the next combat. It's not a huge amount, but Crown of Stars is an okay spell and we just make it a little bit better. I took Plane Shift, and I took Teleport. Uh, and I'm not going to go into huge detail here. I take them for utility. I normally don't prepare them, but when I need them, they're in my spellbook. Antipathy, Sympathy, another spell I won't prepare, but I like to have in my spellbook. And it's something that I often like to cast outside of adventuring. 
The idea is you cast it. It has a 10-day duration. And then if you know what kind of creature type you're coming up against, you can use Antipathy Sympathy to have effects on them while you're adventuring. So it's not going to eat into your spell slots. It's not going to eat into your preparations. It's just going to be a benefit that you have. Another spell I won't prepare is Clone. But Clone, again, is something I might cast out of combat. The idea is you would prepare clones for you and for the rest of your party. And if you die, then your spirit immediately transfers to your clone. Make sure that wherever the clone is, it's got some equipment handy and an ability to get back to wherever you are. Demiplane, another spell I'm going to take and not prepare. But it's just handy to have. You cast Demiplane outside of adventuring and you have this big area where you can just keep stuff. And it's pretty safe when it's in a demi plane. And what you can do is like you have this huge amount of stuff and then you travel across the globe, you cast demi plane again and there it is. It's like the biggest suitcase you could ever imagine. I only prepare one eighth level spell as a wizard and that's maze because maze is the spell I'm going to be casting with that slot. I only get one eighth level slot and it's going to be maze. Maze provides no saving throw and removes an opponent from combat. Now, depending on their intelligence, they might come back within the next few rounds and they might be stuck for the duration or until you drop concentration. So yeah, Maze, just a fantastic spell. Unless something has something like a Rod of Absorption or something like that, Maze just works. Between level 17 and 18, I'll select three ninth level spells. One will be Wish. I'll prepare Wish. It just might be handy. Which covers all those little things that you just aren't counting on. The, the circumstantial stuff, right? So you look at a spell and you go, I'd never prepare that because the chances that I would use it are very low. Those are the kind of spells that you want to hit with a wish spell. I will grab True Polymorph probably at level 18. And basically, I won't prepare it, but it's there if we're not adventuring. And, you know, the poor monk comes up to me and says... Boy, I wish I was a gold dragon instead of a lousy monk, and then I cast True Polymorph on them, and now they're a gold dragon. You're welcome. The spell I'd probably be using is Shape Change. Once again, this is going to work with Bugbear, because we cast Shape Change, and we actually keep our previous racial features. So we will still get Surprise Attack when we're Shape Changed. And what can we do with that? Well, there's probably one kind of obvious choice, and then there's another choice that's not so obvious, but it's kind of fun, so I'm going to talk about it. So this is a Merolith. This is the obvious option. So basically, this is a challenge rating 16, so we can definitely choose it as a viable shape change option. And the Merolith makes seven attacks with their multi-attack. Six with its long swords and one with its tail. That means if we action surge, that's 14 attacks. We have decent chances to hit, and we would get surprise attack on all of them whenever we win initiative. And beyond that, it's still good to be a Merolith after that, because we're still doing good damage on round two. And one really nice thing about a Merolith is it can take one reaction on every turn in combat. So if you cast a shield spell, that doesn't prevent you from doing counter spell on the next turn. And it also has a parry reaction, so you can cast shield against the first attack, and then the next turn you get attacked again and then you could parry on top of that and suddenly you're adding plus 10 to your armor class. So Merolith is probably the best choice for shape change, but I just noticed one other kind of tricky thing and I just wanted to discuss it for a bit. So what if we shape changed into a Hydra and let's say we didn't do it in combat, we did it outside of combat beforehand. Well a Hydra has five attacks because it has five heads. It also has the multiple heads feature. Hydra has five heads. Well, it has more than one head. The Hydra has advantage on saving throws against being blinded, charmed, deaf, and frightened, stunned, and knocked unconscious. That's nice. Whenever the Hydra takes 25 or more damage on a single turn, one of its heads dies. If all of its heads die, the Hydra dies. At the end of its turn, it grows two heads for each of the heads that died since the last turn, unless it has taken fire damage since its last turn. The Hydra regains 10 hit points for each head regrown this way. And it has a multi-attack. The Hydra makes as many bite attacks as it has heads. So the way this is intended to work is basically you're fighting the Hydra. You're killing heads as you go. Multiple heads are growing, but its hit points are always going down. 
because you do 25 points of damage to destroy a head. It then recovers 10 hit points when it grows two heads, so it's down 15 hit points. So eventually you whittle it down and it has zero hit points, and then it stops growing heads, it just dies. However, if you are a PC, that is not the way it's going to go. Let's take a look at last week's build. So the overly attached girl fiend can heal 240 hit points over 10 rounds. So you turn into a Hydra, someone in your party does 25 points of damage to you, make sure it's not fire damage, and boom, you got a second head. But you're down 15 hit points. But the overly attached girl fiend casts an extended aura of vitality with the disciple of life boost, and she's got 20 turns where she can basically give you those 15 hit points back. So we do 20 turns where we cut off a head every round, and then it's replaced by two every round. So if my math is correct, that means at the end of that time, we have 25 heads. And frankly, we could do it again. Overly attached girl fiend does the extended aura vitality again, and suddenly 25 heads becomes 45 heads. Then we enter a combat, and then on round one, when we win initiative, we make 45 attacks and plus 2d6 to all of them. That's hundreds and hundreds of hit points of just bonus damage. And the bite actually has a good chance to hit. It's plus 8 to hit. Now, it's not magical damage, so that could be an issue. But, I mean, once you get enough heads, we don't even care about resistance to that damage anymore. So this one, I mean, it's a bit tricky, right? So I would probably talk to my DM before I did this one. But the way it's written, this should work. So my conclusions here are, you know what? Gloomstalker, Bugbear, they're a natural marriage. And I'm not going to suggest for a second that this character is going to be more effective than a Gloomstalker over 20 levels. I mean, it's eventually a Wizard 18, so it's eventually going to be more powerful than a Gloomstalker simply because of high-level spells. But at those lower levels, Gloomstalker is so good. But what I will say is that I think there are builds where if I was going to make this build... Bugbear is my choice of race. Custom lineage for the extra feet would be great, but just that surprise attack is paying off, and with Wizard, we find multiple ways to make it pay off. Eventually, we can get a ton of attacks on round one with advantage, and we have a plus 13 initiative, so we'll probably win that initiative. Never mind, we can add a d6 when we need to. So we can really make use of Bugbear here. And what I mentioned at the beginning of the video was I went through lots of different ways to make this build, kind of waffled on which one to do. And the reason was is there's a lot of decent builds for Bugbear out there that don't use Gloomstalker, that don't use Assassin, that don't use Battlemaster. I think Fighter 2 is kind of clutch, right? Action Surge on top of Surprise Attack, that's just really good. But beyond that, you have a lot of different ways you can go. And another thing I like here is that I took spells that I normally never take. I never take Scorching Ray. But here, it works. And so I've got a character that's a bit different than all the other wizards I've cast, and that's a good thing. So as I said, I know I kind of just touched on the various aspects of this build. I should mention that I would go back for that second level of fighter after my fifth level of wizard. I think I forgot to mention that, but that's when I would do it. Once I've got those third level spells, and that's when I think you can afford that second level of fighter and then go back to wizard after that. But any questions you have about details of this build, go ahead and just click on the video description and you're going to see the link. Click the link and it'll bring you to this page. And if you're not going to go Gloomstalker, but you want to try out the new Bugbear, I think this is a really strong option. So if you try it out, let me know how it goes. Otherwise, until next time, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you soon.